Let's answer some questions about MS from Twitter and YouTube. Suzanne Hicks asks, what are the treatments for nystagmus in MS? So nystagmus refers to bouncing eye movements, and there are a lot of different causes of it, and a lot of people with MS have some degree of nystagmus and disequilibrium. And if it's not that severe, usually it's treated conservatively with physical therapy, exercise, and certain types of vestibular rehab exercises, such as Epley's maneuvers. But I think Suzanne is referring to a more severe, continuous, and disabling nystagmus nystagmus with disequilibrium, and some people with MS, they have abnormal eye movements that are continuous and can really be very dramatic. I actually have a few people in my practice that are in wheelchairs entirely for this reason, and sometimes the nystagmus is due to a single lesion in an area such as the cerebellum, middle cerebellar peduncle, or another area in the brainstem. And if it's very severe, there are actually medications can be used to treat this, and I'll put in a link to an article that discusses pharmaceutical treatments of nystagmus, and you're seeing some options on the screen here. Some common options include baclofen, which is normally used to treat spasticity in MS, or dalfampridine for aminopyridine, also known by the trade name Ampira, which is FDA approved for walking speed in MS. Other options include gabapentin and Namenda, the Alzheimer's disease drug. I actually find the most effective treatment to be benzodiazepines such as Valium, but it's very addictive, not a great option for long-term use in my opinion. And so they're just different options. We experiment a little bit. We may or may not great, great results, but I have had some success with these options. Please post in the comments below if you've tried something for this with good success. Xavier asks, why are doctors so skeptical of hematopoietic stem cell transplant? Why don't they recommend it more often? So to those who aren't familiar with this, HSCT or hematopoietic stem cell transplant is a treatment of MS where chemotherapy drugs are given that wipe out the immune system and stem cells are given to regenerate the immune system and sometimes this leads to improvement and long-term remission and I previously rated it as the most effective disease modifying therapy in MS and I have a separate video on this exact topic if you want to check it out. So given that, why don't neurologists just recommend it to all of their patients or anyone who would be a good candidate? Well, there are multiple reasons. One of them is neurologists tend tend to be conservative in the modern area. A lot of young people with relapsing MS who would be the best candidates for this treatment also tend to do well on existing disease-modifying therapies and hematopoietic stem cell transplant is quite toxic. And if you think about it, a lot of our patients are young women, and these drugs can cause things like infertility and future cancers. So, you know, you really have to have that discussion with the patient and thinking, I have this other more standard, widely used treatment on which my patient is likely to do pretty well, why am I going to take the risk? I think there's a difference in culture between neurologists and, say, hematologists and oncologists, and that they deal with diseases where people tend to die, like cancer. So they're kind of more aggressive, willing to take more upfront risks, whereas I think neurologists, because we have patients that we spend many years with that live a long time, even though they certainly may have neurological problems, we're kind of afraid to take that upfront risk. Now, may, that may be a little bit paternalistic. People have done surveys that have found that patients are more willing to take risks than doctors. And so there is a little bit of a psychology there. Uh, I think people do underestimate the significance of the symptoms. And unfortunately, it is the most aggressive regimens of hematopoietic stem cell transplant that really give the best long-term results. I actually have a separate video comparing different regimens in HSCT. And it turns out regimens such as cytoxan plus anti-thymocyte -thy globulin, like what Dr. Richard Burt used to do at Northwestern, isn't necessarily all that effective in the very long term. I'm not sure that's actually better than drugs such as Lymtrata or Ocrevus, whereas BEAM, the, the higher intensity regimen, which is more toxic, is definitely more effective. So there's definitely a trade-off there. Another thing is there's a logistical issue. Even if I wanted that my patient to get that treatment, it wouldn't necessarily be so easy. A lot of bone marrow transplant teams, they don't treat autoimmune disease. That's just not their business. You know, neurology is a separate field from hematology. So there's sort of a divide there. And then also there could be issues with insurance that they won't cover it. If I have a patient that has overwhelming inflammation and I think they need a very aggressive therapy, I think I would just admit them to the hospital and give them cyclophosphamide myself because after all, it's the chemotherapy that's doing the work not the stem cells. The other thing, and this is more of the dark side of the response, is marketing. Let's be serious. A lot of these MS drugs are very expensive. Companies hold a patent on them. They market it very aggressively to both patients with MS and neurologists. That works a lot, 
Whereas hematopoietic stem cell transplant, it's not a single drug. A lot of these drugs are older and dirt cheap. I mean, cytoxan is just pennies compared to modern disease modifying therapies for MS. So no one's really pushing this treatment and it's not a single treatment. And so it's less likely to become well-established. So it's kind of a lot of different reasons. Tina asks, are there theories about disruption of the blood-brain barrier and multiple sclerosis? That's an excellent question. So for those who don't know, the blood-brain barrier is a natural barrier between the blood, the peripheral immune system essentially and the central nervous system and you can take a look at this diagram that barrier is formed by endothelial cells of the blood vessels themselves and cells of the central nervous system called astrocytes and parasites and there's this idea that a leakiness of the blood brain barrier causes immune cells to get in and cause inflammation so the immune system is regulated in a very complicated way it sort of regulates itself but part of the way your immune system prevents attacking self antigens in other words, the surfaces of proteins in your own body that it shouldn't be attacking is this idea of compartmentalization. So you sort of keep your peripheral immune system away from antigens you don't want it to attack. There's a blood-brain barrier. There's a blood testes barrier. There's also barriers against lymphocyte infiltration of the gastrointestinal tract. So it's part of immune system regulation. And there's evidence of breakdown of the blood-brain barrier in multiple sclerosis. For instance, people have done fancy multimodal MRI studies and shown that there's some evidence of disruption at the level of the blood vessel prior to a relapse in some cases. And some people have speculated that certain environmental factors such as diet, disruption of the microbiome, and smoking could contribute to blood-brain barrier disruption, though no exact sequence of events leading to MS has been found. I should also point out that the drug Tysabri in MS works by preventing lymphocytes, a subclass of white blood cell, from entering the nervous system through an intact blood-brain barrier. Barrier. And so it's very effective in preventing new relapses and new lesions on MRI scans and disability progression and brain atrophy. So it definitely works in MS despite only working on an intact blood-brain barrier. So I don't think that disruption of the blood-brain barrier is like the sole cause of MS. It's probably just part of the pathogenesis. Desiree asks, what type of urinary symptoms can people with MS get? So there's this phenomenon that occurs for people with any kind of spinal cord injury, particularly with injury to the center of the spinal cord, known as neurogenic bladder. This is getting urinary symptoms due to neurological disease, and some people with MS can have this, and you can get this phenomenon where the sphincter muscles are sort of tight, and so even though the bladder is contracting, you don't drain out all the urine, and there can be increased urine volume in the bladder even after urination. And so if we do an ultrasound of the bladder after urination, we can see the volume of urine inside of it. This is known as the post-void residual. Normally, it's less than 50 milliliters, but some people with MS, if they have this, it could be 100 milliliters or even greater, and it can cause various symptoms. The most common is urinary frequency, having to go to the bathroom often, and there are medications to treat this, or urinary hesitancy, that feeling like you have to urinate, but it's hard to empty all of it. And then sometimes it could even cause incontinence, like leakage of urine, and this is actually much more common in women who are more prone to urinary incontinence anyways, especially if they've had pregnancies and deliveries. And then the last would be frequent urinary tract infections, just because the bladder is sort of overfilled and isn't draining well, and that can cause bacteria to grow. And I have a separate video about how to prevent urinary tract infections in MS if you're prone to them. Donald Duck asks, what are the early signs of walking disability in MS? Now, of course, walking disability can be very dramatic and obvious in the form of a relapse, but I think Donald is referring to sort of a slow, insidious change in gait that is often initially unrecognized. So this can occur in people with early progressive MS, particularly people who are a little bit older, and it develops so slowly that people don't necessarily complain about it right away because they don't really notice it on a day-to-day -day basis. So my experience is the most typical symptom would be gait fatigue, in other words, symptoms when walking long distances. So some examples could be something like, you know, I used to be able to walk five miles and now on a hot day I could only do three miles and I'm beat or after I walk a few miles my right leg is dragging or people would say you know I used to be able to go to Dodger Stadium walk from the parking lot walk up the steps no problem now that's very difficult for me to do or the same thing if I go to Disneyland or the mall it's very difficult or maybe they would say you know I used to be the fast walker my wife had trouble keeping up with me but now it's the opposite she walks too fast for me and I have trouble keeping up with her and I have to ask for us to sit down and rest so sort of an induced 
reducible gait disability over long distances. That's kind of the symptom that I often hear as the early sign of gait decline in multiple sclerosis. Mazzy asks, what are the most exciting things you saw in multiple sclerosis research in the past year? Great question, and I'll give you three answers. Number one, Christina Cranky, who developed a lipid nanoparticle using the technology from the Pfizer BioNTech and Moderna COVID-19 vaccines to create a vaccine against a mouse model of MS, experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. Now, this is very preliminary. This is just in mice, but she was able to create a lipid nanoparticle containing messenger RNA coding for MOG, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, a known antigen in multiple sclerosis, and it did in fact reduce disability in this mouse model of MS. Maybe someday this type of technology could be used to create a vaccine for MS in humans. Number two is in general the development of drugs that are Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors. These drugs work on B lymphocytes indirectly, but they're likely much less deleterious in terms of weakening the immune system compared to B cell depleting drugs such as rituximab, ocrevus, and casimta. One example is the drug mesenchymal Sitinib, and I did a video on that earlier. I really think these drugs could come to market relatively soon, and they could be great options for people who are older with progressive MS who aren't necessarily great candidates for other disease-modifying therapies. And number three is the study done by Dr. Terry Walls. I give her tremendous credit for producing the first ever randomized controlled trial of two different diets to treat multiple sclerosis. She compared her diet, the Walls Paleo diet, versus the swank low saturated fat diet in relapsing MS. She found both diets seem to help with MS fatigue and improved quality of life. Maybe her diet was a little bit better. And I just love actually seeing good research so that we can give evidence-based advice regarding lifestyle in the treatment of multiple sclerosis.